Hello and welcome to Glaswegian Geeks. Today we've got a lovely little horror here. A little suspenseful, traumatising horror for me anyway. Uh, James? Well, couldn't be anything else because it's John Carpenter's The Thing. Oh, I thought you were going to time that with the actual credit coming up there. And I was just like, <laughs> do it, do it. <laughs> uh, you have to do it really slow motion. The thing. <laughs> just, just the thing. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, no. <laughs> that's not happening. Also, the best use of a bin bag ever. That credit. That's a bin bag, by the way. They just what? burnt it out. You don't know that. Do you not know anything? <laughs> uh, it's a bin bag. Yeah, they put a bin bag over a fish tank with a light going through it and then burnt it with a, uh, a blowtorch. It's like, I know there, some right? stuff, but yeah. I did not know that. That is Some of us watched the documentary. Oh, <laughs> some of us are just <laughs> nerds. <laughs> yes. Anyway, yeah, it's a thing. So I'm sitting in the middle of a couch right now with two gay men. <laughs> <laughs> One gay man on your right and a straight on your left. Oh. So technically, you are the filling in a... Man's damage. Yes, a man's not the for the first time. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute, am I not a man? What? Are you a girl, not yet a woman? Sorry, there's also a kitten involved here. In case, so if we get case, distracted, in case you wonder why we just so suddenly go quiet, <laughs> uh, there's a kitten crawling about. Yeah, so Who's we are kind of you, like. Are you sure about that wire? Uh, maybe I'll take that wire away yeah. from. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so today we're talking about John Carpenter's The Thing. Mm-hmm. A snowy adventure. It's, it's almost a Christmas film. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for all the family. <laughs> for the whole family. Um, yeah. Well, where do we start with the thing? Well, masterpiece. Masterpiece, if you want to call it that. I think I, 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 I think it's nothing short of a masterpiece, to be honest. I oh, think yeah. it's really, really fantastic. It's a film that I think genuinely captures, re- captures real tension. It's yeah, it's a very much par- it's paranoia. It's it's best and kind of such a and also what you like such an easy film to see as in it's just one set kind of thing. It's it's very kind of one kind of core cast. It's kind of the sim- It's like a play. It's like yeah, very it's, simple. it's like that one location, sort of you know, in a situation has been dropped into it, and you're just literally it's a character piece. Just seeing how yeah. these people. Uh, react to this horrible situation, and I like that. I think I think John Carpenter, John Carpenter, really can sell that, and not many people can. Yeah, John Carpenter's a very big fan of westerns, and he's got a way of kind of turning these films into like um, like westerns. Like Assault and Peace at Thirteen is very much a western kind of vibe to it. It's not dissimilar to The Thing, and kind of all set in this kind of one location. And The Thing is like a western. It's like a standoff. But obviously the thing that they're standing off isn't uh, Indians? Are you allowed to say Indians these days? Cowboys and Indians? Uh, it's not Indians, it's uh, I, I would say a so. thing. Are you allowed to call it a thing? Is it non-binary? Non-binary <laughs> alien. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a non... It's a non-binary entity. Yes, yes, that's... Yeah, <laughs> that's it. And... Your man. Oh, Kurt Russell, sorry, yeah, I got very distracted Came on the TV there. Uh... And it's Kurt Russell at his best. His absolute best. Oh yeah, peak. This is peak Kurt Russell. Peak, peak. Kurt Russell. It's the hair. I mean, look at that hair. Um, is that Snake Plissken hair? No, Snake Plissken was longer and straighter hair. Mm. And it's a bit like that though, because of the beard and that. But Snake close. Plissken's beard was also a bit tighter. Mm. As you can see from my picture of Snake Plissken over there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's yeah. Kurt Russell totally makes this film everything it is, and he's kind of the perfect kind of character for this film as well. Yeah, especially being that he's John Carpenter. Uh, John Carpenter is very subtle with the kind of tension to start with. Just you can tell that everybody's got a little bit of like almost not hate, but just they're they're worn away with each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, uh, kind of, it comes obvious, in. obviously they're uh, working away up Alaska. No, 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 Antarctic, Antarctic. Hold on, they're working away up at Antarctica, so they're secluded. They're working with each other. They're spending twenty four seven with each other. You can tell that there's a kind of little bit of uh, friction between them. That's the word I was looking yeah. for. Uh, and everything that follows, 
only magnifies that a thousandfold. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, I think, if this film was kind of made today, it would start from the beginning of the expedition. It kind of does that thing where it kind of comes in midway through. And, like I say, the film doesn't, it starts off straight away with the the dog coming to the base. Uh, It kind of starts off kind of telling you where exactly you're going to go straight off, which is what's great about it as well. Yeah, John Carpenter's really, really good for... I mean, we know him as the guy who won't make a film unless he's got the music right, you know. He yeah. He's he's a guy who really kind of works around the actual plot before he actually gets into the story. Yeah, and this is the very first film... I think it's the first film he's ever done. I think the only film he's ever done, he's not wrote the score. Yeah. Uh, it's Ennio Monacone, it does it, which is a very John Carpenter score, though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's got an amazing orchestral score behind it, which a lot of it there was. I think there's a lot more expansiveness to it, which a lot of the stuff they didn't use was put into the Hateful Eight. Because uh, yeah. anyone, anyone want to coin did the soundtrack for that as well. Yeah. So, should we start with the story, Chris? Take it away. What is the plot? There's a base in Antarctica, American base. Uh, Always like, American. Yeah. Well, I think Antarctica at that time. That's like it's divvied up. Um, Antarctica. I'm. I'm really. If I'm going to sound stupid, but what's the opposite of Antarctica? What's the opposite one? You got Antarctica, and then you got the one at the <laughs> bottom. <laughs> why, none of, why would none of us remember in this? <laughs> anyway, so it's in Antarctica. Yes, anyway, but these are they're divvied up between different countries. Um, if they're doing research, so like Russia will have a base, kind of Norwegian's got a base. It's all these different bases they'll have to do these different scientific research. Uh, so it starts off with a helicopter chasing a dog, Norwegian helicopter, and um, and it's a kind of a, a wolf dog, and basically they try to kill it, and then they, they end up dying in an accident, and then the group of American men take the dog in, and there's something inside the dog yeah. that basically can replicate human. Well, anything. Yeah, yeah pretty much, yeah, anything. Uh, and basically, it seems to have a plan, and you don't trust who's who anymore. That is well, that's quite an interesting way to introduce the the antagonist of this film. You, you know, the film opens with the dog. With the thing, you could say. With the th- well, the dog. But you do see a lot of shots of this dog. Yeah. And if you don't really know what's going on, you're like, what the fuck is with this dog? Yeah. But... Yeah, uh, it's eventually obviously revealed that the dog. Yeah, is like why are they shooting at the dog? Something. There's so many questions at the beginning of it, like what's actually going on. But there's something you can tell straight away. The dog's really well trained. There's something not right with the dog. It's very calculating. The, the, the actor, the dog actor, it's called Jed. I don't know why I know that, but that actual dog's <laughs> called Jed. Uh, but a very good dog actor. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's almost as if it's trying to gain their trust right away by being all friendly and lovey-dovey up to them, you know? Like, well, kind of sucker them in, like, feel sorry, you know? watching for the weak know? ones. If you, I, I always think it watches for the weak ones. Mm. It's sitting there gauging who's the most affectionate towards it and who's going to be the, w- the weaker one, who's yeah, going to be the one that first. take first, yeah. Uh, so it's quite... that You see it wandering around the base quite a lot before it starts. And again, the thing... I've watched the thing about a million times and you always kind of forget that it does kick off quite quickly, the scene where the dog transforms. Uh, it happens quite quick in the film, but it always feels like it takes slower, but it's that way that you see the dog kind of wandering around a bit and kind of watching everyone and what it's doing. It's almost like picking off the dynamics of the people as well. So it knows, it's almost picking up on who's who likes each other and who doesn't. Yeah. So it knows how so to So it knows how to it. twist it. Yeah. So... Um, do you ever get to see the full thing of what the thing actually is? You never do because it seems to, at the end, you see the, the replication of everything that it seems to have gets copied over the years. Yeah, kind of. Uh, uh, just veering off the subject, T2 does uh, identical to that at the end, basically copies the T1000 going through everything that's replicated. True. Well, I was a bit annoyed me the bit of Terminator 2 at the end when the boobs. What boobs? The bit in the when it falls into the the lead, yeah, and then when it kind of does that thing when it morphs into all the different ones, there's I think it's supposed to be what do you call it, John Connor's step mum, yeah, yeah, but yeah, like she's topless and her boobs are there, ah, uh. and it's just weird, it just throws you off. Sorry, I, it just came into my head that uh, bit, you know, just boobs, tits, yeah, you know? and you just think well, metallic tits as well, metallic uh, tits on fire, 
tits. Uh, <laughs> tits. Uh, <laughs> it's not so, a film. <laughs> it's got tits in yeah, it, apparently. And also, it's been there for a long time as well because they find the spaceship and the spaceship, the Norwegians dug it up, but it's been there for millions of years as well. So whatever this thing is, uh, it's been flying through space for a very long time. Yeah. One of the things I really want to get into is just how well done, not necessarily, the plot is very good, but like the characters around, like all the characters genuinely seem as if they've spent all this time together. Yeah. They have throwaway links to one another as a sort of, very dismissing sometimes, and you can tell right away who likes who and who doesn't like who, and it's never really explicitly stated that someone doesn't like someone, but you can just tell. And I think a lot of films nowadays don't do that. Yeah, it would be too obvious. They would just make it straight away, I fucking hate you. And then you're like, oh, yeah, there's a tension straight away. Uh, I think as well for the making of this, they had a long time to prep for it. So when they picked up actors, I think they rehearsed quite a lot. Uh, obviously, some of it's filmed up in, I think it's Nova Scotia, where they filmed some of it. So I think they had all the external stuff they filmed in there, but the rest is all filmed on set uh, in Los Angeles. And I think that way that they had a lot of rehearsal time. Mm-hmm. So they kind of all got to know their characters. But also the fact that the thing's a remake itself. The thing's a remake of The Thing from Another World, which is a Howard Hawks film from the 50s. And it's based on a really famous kind of book slash play called Who Goes There, which has been kind of used numerous times. Uh, so I, I think it was like The Thing's the greatest thing where everyone talks about how amazing it is. And you're like, yeah, and people slack off remakes. And you're like, The Thing's a remake. It's one of the best remakes that ever is, but it's, it's still unhandled. I think, it's, remake. I think it's, to me, this version of the thing is more of a... Uh, to me, it's like a, a bit of a reimagining. It's a, and for that time, it's bringing it up to their sort of one day. It's not dissimilar to the original thing. It's just the effects. That's the only thing that changes it. And the, th- the thing in the thing is more man-like, kind of alien supposed to be, but it's no, the tension is completely there. The characters are there. And the original, the thing from another world, is definitely all about uh, like a character piece. And unlike this one, contains it contains one woman in it as well, uh, all set in Antarctica. But the thing originally was supposed to have, as in John Carpenter, was supposed to have a woman in it, uh, but they kind of changed it last minute. I'm actually thinking here, uh, I know The Blob was a remake as well. Yes, brilliant remake is, as well. Yeah. Uh, are these maybe the first like proper remakes? Um... Uh, like, I'm trying to th- rack my brain here. Like, I know everyone goes on about them nowadays because, oh, hold, hold on, here's a prequel that you didn't know that existed. Uh, but I'm, I think The Blob and this were r- out about the same time. Uh, this is 1981 and The Blob remake is 1987. Oh, my God, I need to get out more. Uh, it's about 1987. You uh, fucking nerd. I love the Blob remake, though. I love the Blob remake. It's one of I my do. favorite films it's, in the 80s. It's always actually one of the uh, horror movies that's kind of scared me. Like this. Because it kills this the kids. This big green. It kills the kids. Blob thing that basically is like uh, acid way feelings. Yeah. It's just the fact that the kid in it, like one of the kids in it, dies and you never. It's a very rare thing for that to happen. <coughs> uh, so, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> but, yeah, it's. I think it might. It's. Definitely kind of those... Yeah, The Blob as well. A lot of people kind of don't really credit that as a remake, but it is. Yeah, I mean, if if people mention The Thing in that, they'll always say, oh, The Thing's a classic. You know what I mean? A classic. It is a classic. Normally kind of saying, oh, it's like the first thing of of, of its kind, not really remembering (laughs) that something did come before it. And like you were saying about the, you know, the the previous version of it, how they tried to make the thing seem more man-like and stuff yeah. like that. I really like that you don't see it. Yeah. I think that's one of the, the shining points in it, that you don't... I think if I'd seen it in this film, it would take me at the moment. The not seeing it just keeps it... the unknown, the tension, and I really, really enjoy that. Especially that, that moment there with the shadow as well. And not really... Know, and the fade-outs as well. The fade-outs in this I love for some reason because it always implies that something's kind of going on. I do love a fade-out in a film. Uh, it obviously, it's used to show time is passing, but it's that way that they, they use it to build up tension, like to almost cut a scene. Because yeah. it's not just the fact that the fade-outs happen in the film. If you notice quite a few times, the fade-out, as it's fading out, pauses and then fades out, so you don't kind of get to see what happens next, which is kind of good. Uh, the very first remake, so you, just so you know, was in 1903. Uh, it was the Great Train Robbery. That's a very boring fact for you. 
Um, but I think it's it's the thing with the thing. I keep saying this. The thing with the thing uh, is this film was panned when it came out. I mean, we know it as a classic now, but the film was panned completely. Like John Carpenter, like I think he he always says he this is the one that he took the hardest uh, because he obviously put a lot of hard work into it. It didn't do well at all. It was kind of ripped into. People said there was this effects were over the top uh they were too gory for what it was and it was one of those things that through vcrs coming out uh it kind of gained notoriety also really another boring fact that i sad to do know as well uh, longest running film ever in glasgow glasgow was the place that showed this for the longest in the cinema i think it ran it for over a year so i think it was something like 56 weeks so in the Odeon in Renfield Street when it was there. What, Glasgow loved it that much? Well, it just apparently it was doing really, really well. It just kept like performing really, really well. So they did it. But it didn't make its money back at all. Uh, it was it's deemed as a commercial failure. But now, this day, it's just such a classic. There's a bit of insight for you. Glasgow yeah. knew it was a classic. Glasgow, we knew. We um, just knew. So yeah, I mean, it was the, from coming out in video was the thing that kind of built that up and made it what it is. So you could kind of say those uh, early day Glaswegian geeks... Yeah. No, they're fucking movies. Is that a dick at my age? Like just because oh, no, no, I was no, no, around. No, 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 I don't mean you. Just because I was around at the time. I was young. Were you still called an Erd in your day? Did you have a different name? Different title? No, I think people just called me an Erd. I just called it Weirdo. Weirdo was a freak posse was what we used to get called in school. Glaswegian Weirdos. That's yeah, what we'll call weirdos. ourselves now. Weirdo Weirdos. <gasps> oh. Trademark. Copyright. Yeah. <laughs> Changing our name. Yeah, Weirdo Weirdos. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's one of those films. Over time, it's become what it is. Um, and it, I think John Carpenter now kind of they kind of that's why I think they do lots of things about it now, and they'll talk about it, and they'll do documentaries, and they're releasing like still to this day the soundtrack, and they'll release kind of like you know every time it comes out again. I think Arrow released it, did a pre-release for the Blu-ray two weeks ago, and there was only four thousand of the Steelbook, four thousand of the normal limited edition and it crashed their website and sold wow. out instantly uh, because that's how much uh, people go crazy for it. I think the thing is the staple for the modern day action movie. Yeah. It very much feels like action movies you would see today but in that sort of time and it just, it fits this. It doesn't feel generic. This feels like to me I'll always view the thing as the first sort of sci-fi horror like that has like really strong action elements. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, but then not a lot happens in it. When you do actually do watch it, you're like, oh, okay, not a lot's sorry, going on. Maybe that came out wrong. Mur- no, it's murder mystery. Yes. Yeah, it's a very, it's a mystery. It's it's um it's like the Italian giallo. It's that kind of thing where it's very much you don't know what's going on. You don't know who the killer is. You don't know what, and it's basically people trying to figure it out uh, before it's too late, kind of thing. Uh, it's I always think it's very deemed as a man's movie as well. Like the kind of thing, I think that's just to do with its very strong male cast, obviously. Well, you said it was it was the the original before that that had a woman. It had a woman, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think they originally wanted to have a woman in this, and she was supposed to be pregnant. It had this whole thing written in it, but then I think somebody actually said, "I think it would work better without a woman in it," uh, because that could obviously build to the re- the reason why the men are so tense. Um, so yeah, that's kind of partly why they did that. Uh, but I, again, it's one of these. It's just I always think it's dateless as well. For a film that's made in the 80s, I don't think it looks like it's made in the 80s. Or maybe that's just me refusing to let go of the 80s. Yeah, it certainly doesn't look as if it's done in the 80s. I would say maybe in 90s. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, you look at their uh, technology that they've got there and okay. it is maybe the badly chest dated. Okay, the chess widders, maybe. Um, like, h- hold on, we'll just get this old computer out. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's the thing. It's only really the computers that have really changed like that, that like take those out the equation here yeah everything else is still like current day tech yeah and it's one of these things that's kind of influenced so many things i mean there's one of the best episodes of the x files is very much thing based it's in the very first season as well where it's set in antarctica and it's about a kind of a parasite that goes in people's necks oh yeah the worm one yeah 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 people makes them violent that is just an amazing episode because it is just a love letter to the thing and then obviously for its anniversary which maybe it was 30th uh the reboot prequel came out uh which had been they've been working on for a long time it spawned a whole series of comics yeah it spawned a computer game 
Yeah, it's the, done, it's the well, computer it? game it's actually much followed really good. Yeah. Uh, this movie. Yeah, it was the same as the comics. It was a sequel. Um, and it's just one of these things that's lasted. It's become like a cult within itself. What became a cult movie has now gone elevated beyond a cult movie to actually being seen as a classic. Yeah. I think that uh, the video game actually came out maybe around its 20th anniversary. Yeah. Because I, I remember mean, it was uh, in my very early PC gaming days and I eventually dialed up that video and uh, watched it and I, I remember watching that movie not long before this. That's why I kind of uh, creamed myself, so to speak. Yeah. And I was like, oh my god, that looks terrifying. Like, you you, you play one of the early Resi games and it scares you shitless. Yeah. That's, that trailer scared me shitless to the point of I've actually not played it. Uh, I, 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 I'm I hard on the outside, but I'm a big softy on the inside. <laughs> uh, which is better than being soft on the outside and hard on the inside. Yeah. Like a kinder egg, mm. hey. uh, and it is. It's just. It's, uh, we can keep talking about it. It's perfect. It is just a perfect film. It's really well acted. The effects are phenomenal oh, uh, for don't, practical don't effects. Don't even start. And basically, about that's just the effects. genius that is uh, Rob Bottin, uh, who at the time was like twenty one. He was so young uh, doing the effects for this, Fuck and no. the only reason he didn't, he got the gig, was because Rick Baker uh, went to go do American Wolf in London. Who was supposed to do the effects for it, but he was uh, Rob Bottin was his protege, uh, and then pretty much they let him do what he wanted. And some of the effects, I remember I read stuff about the cast were saying that they were dubious about it as well. They were like, "These are a bit." It was a lot of the budget went to effects as well, uh, and it's just that way that they do make the film completely because still to this day the the practical effects are astounding in it, and it's it's a dying art, which is quite sad. Yeah, uh, when we. Me and James recorded a review for Predator. Yes. We uh, spoke at great lengths about practical effects and how in this day and age it would just be like a big CG monster now and it just it yeah. doesn't add anything. It takes so much away. Whereas something like the practical effects of the thing just... Like, it's even uh, when it's a spider kind of head. Yeah. It's... Is it not like stop animation? No, that's no. a real that's a real thing. The end creature reveal is stop motion, but there's they deleted a lot of that out. There's because uh, they realised it was too stop motion looking, uh, and that was one of the the kind of I mean again not going on about the reboot or the prequel. They had all done practical effects for that film. They had spent so much money. They made these amazing practical effects, and at the last minute. Universal got a bit nervous and then CGI'd some over over some of the actual practical effects because you can actually go on YouTube and watch the tests of the original practical effects and a lot of the effects I mean I'll give I didn't realize that on that prequel are actual practical effects but they look so good because uh, they wanted to obviously kind of copy it because obviously it's set before it so they have to to make it look very similar but practical effects are making a comeback which is a good thing. Yeah, practical effects are so important. Like a film I'm working on just now, we're using practical effects and it just, you can tell a difference completely. Yeah. You know, just being there and seeing it, you can see a genuine difference. And like I say, I think, it, call me old-fashioned, but I think it should be a crime if you're going to make a monster-themed horror film not to use practical effects. I, th- I think that should be a crime. Yeah, I mean, I think if it's going to be heavily monster-based, then you kind of have to... I mean, something that is obviously one of the more recent films. I mean, this is about an alien. Yeah, I mean, you would expect this nowadays to be CG, but even the yeah. reboot didn't go full. No, it CG didn't. It was it. a lot of practical in it, uh, yeah. which it was good. It was it was true to that. Yeah, it was. It stayed degree. really similar. And again, it's a film that came out recently called The Void, and The Void is about kind of John Carpenter, kind of H.P. Lovecraft, and all the effects are practical and they're astounding. But again, I think your your brain's been so reconditioned now to see in CGI that when you see practical effects, you kind of almost don't believe that they're practical because they're just so well done. Uh, I, but can these tell, I can tell practical effects. Aren't you special? 
Uh, <laughs> is that that movie that you're working on that you just tried to plug? You're working on a movie? No, I didn't drop its name, you see. Oh, right, okay. You're building up to that one, aren't you? Though? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, just using it as, as an example. Uh, we'll, we'll make it, uh, let's talk about me for a minute. Uh, I'm like the thing. <laughs> you're like the thing? <laughs> That's what you kind of went. Uh, talking about my own life, uh, the thing <laughs> can really. You're to yourself as the thing, and I was like, yeah, you are what I imagine it to look like. Look at that VHS. A wooden panel VHS player. Sorry. <sighs> Things like that just get me excited. Um, <laughs> and as a ch- as a ch- as a person of a certain generation, uh, for me this was a staple in the video shop when I was a kid. It was one of those things that you did rent out and you saw quite early, uh, kind of that kind of nineteen eighty two three kind of time. Oh. Was there a behind the counter version of this? No, uh, it was released by Universal, which was released by CIC, which was a kind of weird sub thing of Universal. And it was fairly uncut, which it was always. It was no. It was never deemed as a video nasty. Ma- Mario's looking at me like he doesn't know what's on about. Do you know the under counter stuff? No. Basically, when the whole video nasty scare went, I'll, I'll do this very quickly. So when videos first came out, videos weren't uh, obviously unlike cinema, because cinemas films were censored and they were basically they were rated and they were graded. Whereas when videos came out, there was no such thing in place at that point because okay. they were new so basically all these films that had been censored in the cinema things like now uncensored yeah they would just come out in video uncensored so you would get copies of like uh cannibal holocaust and you get copies of like last house on the left and all these films that may have been banned as well they were all just coming out and then basically they had to step in and regulate it which became a big bit on a thing in the parliament it went back and forth and back and forth for ages and then that's when the ratings this was one of the very first films that came out with a rating um but there's a lot of films that are they're called pre-cert, uh, and that's when they don't have any certification on them at oh. the side or anything like that. So you get like pre-certs before they actually got it. There was a big one of the films that we talked about, the Burnin. The Burnin was one of the kind of the famous ones because it accidentally got released as the uncut version, and then they had to recall all the versions of it. And basically, they ch- how you knew you got a recalled version was because the logo was a different color for the burning but then all the video shops didn't bin the things like they were supposed to they kept all the, the uncut ones under the counter so if you went and said to oh, them oh okay. can i get that they would have all the stuff under the counter that's how i saw a lot of these so yes, the that sh- that's your brief <laughs> refresher on the video i did my dissertation on it <laughs> <laughs> it's the reason why i've got vhs written on my list uh no it's, it was a big thing so it was it kind of defined the whole thing but so many films they panicked cut a lot of films as well because films that like got like the thing they would get like an 18 certificate in the cinema and it passed fine uh some films a lot of companies panicked about and they pulled them back and cut them and they cut them so badly that it was not like it, the word noticeable does not describe it i mean there was halloween 3 when that got cut for no reason those bits where the scene would play onto a different scene and you would hear the noise of someone getting drilled in the head from a previous scene it was so sloppily done <laughs> that it kind of made the film almost because you were like what the hell just happened but then films i knew when i was a kid that i always thought were normal like versions of it like some of the early friday the 13th when they all first came out in dvd after like the hint for um james Furman, the head censor left um they just brought them out uncut and i remember seeing these films on dvd and i was just like what the fuck uh, because there was just so many little scenes put back into it because they now could show but the thing has never changed rating i think it's still an 18 uh, some films tend to change rating over the years as well, but the thing's always been an eighteen. So, but I think it's because it is obviously quite gory. Yeah, uh, the scene we've got this on the background, and the scene we're at is when the husky dog starts uh, opening up. Yeah, <laughs> not uh, like not like physical, not like mentally, physically. <laughs> yeah. Just going to the huskies like I've just had to escape a Norwegian camp. They were yeah. fucking oh, dicks. It's really hard. Uh, should we get a diorama? Should we just play the diorama and talk about it? <laughs> My diorama. The yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the dog opening up. Like, look, uh, yeah, it's like I don't feel. Oh, I don't, I don't, don't feel, feel that great. You know, be, this could be. I the feel end. a bit husky. I feel a bit chubby. I mean, I'm feel, I'm feeling great. I feel. I feel I need to be put down. Yeah. Um, well. Well, like just, just like slagged <laughs> off. You're a shit dog. <laughs> you shit dog. <laughs> there you go. That's you put down. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. Um. So the thing. The thing is loose. Uh, <laughs> it is, and again, the casting of this is amazing. Kurt Russell is just amazing. And this is the uh, third film that he had worked on with John Carpenter because he had previously done Escape from New York and he did Elvis. Uh, before that, the TV film about Elvis that John Carpenter made, which is actually very good. Um, 
so this was kind of led to a bit of a partnership with him um which is, is that, fantastic I, I mean i tell you what i quite like in terms of like the plot you, you know how when you know the dog starts kind of opening up mm-hmm. I bet you and in and, and a modern day film you'd have somebody say by the way something's wrong with the dog and yeah. everybody'd fob it off until something bad actually happened well in this everybody's like fuck we need to get to the dog <laughs> what's happening you know everybody kind of to be fair if that was going on in front of you would you not be like what the fuck no no but you get what i mean like films today it's like if somebody cries wolf and nobody listens and then something happens to them cry husky cry husky. Somebody cries husky. <laughs> yeah somebody cries uh, husky yeah and nobody listens until you know an actual human gets hurt i also think there's a very human reaction in this as well and this is actually the bit that's happening right now it's a very human reaction to obviously as it starts to trying to get the other dogs and they're killing all the dogs to stop it from doing it that people are reacting to the dogs getting killed which is a very much a thing uh, because people obviously have a lot of attachments to animals they have more of attachments to animals than they do humans i think the, the actual human like they are isolated you know all the cast in this are genu- generally isolated yeah and i think that helps because you know certain characters have relationships to the animals yeah and, you know, look after them. So, you know, it is that a very human reaction. And again, it's something you don't really see often today. Yeah, yeah and I think, it, again, they wouldn't show the dog getting killed because dogs always survive. Uh, or kind of Independence Day, that kind of, you know, I'll jump in slow motion as things are blowing up behind me, but I'll survive it. <laughs> uh, okay, lassie. <laughs> uh, but, no, it's, it's great. And that kind of sets up the scene as well. And it sets up the scene after this when they obviously they kill the dog or they think they've killed the thing. Uh, that it sets up the whole thing going well who is now a thing and who's not because we've now physically seen it but we don't know how many people it's came in contact with so it kind of it takes on the kind of this is like it, it works in three acts this film i think is that kind of initial opening act where it takes you out to where the dog does then it's got the kind of act with them all not trusting each other and then it's got that final act where they decide to start burning down the camp uh to kind of they realize that they're not, yeah they're not getting out so there's no point so they decide to just shut it down completely um and that's what's great about the film it's just again it's one of those films i never get bored of as well it's just it's a good staple like kind of movie it's like i I honestly can't fault this movie it's got gore which i love a great deal of suspense and those practical effects like we're watching them dissect the thing right now on the table and it is just that absolute thing of beauty like how how can you you go? Oh, we'll just go for CGI. Who who obviously will be uh, down to money, but how can you say no to something like this? But I don't imagine that CGI is cheaper than practical. I just imagine CGI is a lot more expensive, no matter what. I always think practical is is costless because it must cost a lot of money to do really good CGI. Well, look at the the Incredible Hulk. And the Avengers films, yeah. that costs a million yeah. alone just to get the Hulk. You know, so CGI is expensive. I mean, I think the issue is, like, practically, when you're filming, people think it's just easier yeah. to prepare to do it for CG. Personally, I don't like CG because I usually find in lower budget films, it's not very good. No. Even in some high budget films, it's not really good. And it ages. CGI yeah. ages. I don't think that does not look aged to me. The practical effects in this. In like, some points, it does. I think, but then that's part of its charm. I, I think, think as I think, well. I think to me, like even though it's a big mutant by this point, it looks genuine. Oh no, it's like you know, a genuine, real thing. And obviously, when it does certain things, and again, a lot of these things were like uh, experimentations of like doing practical effects. Uh, I think the one bit where the guy's head kind of snaps off and it does that whole thing. Uh, that bit, apparently, like, four of them all collapsed on the set because he had mi- the guy, Rob Bottin, mixed so many toxic chemicals and, like, stuff to get certain colours and certain reactions that when, obviously, it started to do what it was doing, that the gas came out of it and literally four of them passed out because, obviously, they were, like, this is very much pre-work conditions kind of thing. So that's what's kind of pra- amazing about it because, again, it is, like, Rob Bottin, who didn't have, like, weirdly, I mean, he did its effects for quite a few films, but he didn't... Uh, it was kind of that very... 80s i mean if you look at someone like kmb as well they all came from these things like the walking dead those are the guys that kind of initially kind of took the next mantle over uh in the late 80s who started doing like day of the dead and started doing all these kind of other movies and then they kind of all progressed from there but uh they all kind of always learned from someone i think 
yeah, Rob Bottin learned from Rick Baker. Rick Baker learned from Dick Miller. Dick Miller? And Dick Miller is the guy that did the effects for, like, I want to say Dick Miller, but I think I'm getting that wrong. It's Dick something. Uh, who did the effects for The Exorcist and stuff like that. So it's that way they all learn from someone. And that's where all these... So this is, like, generations of generations of people learning and adapting it, which is what's amazing about it. I mean, I think It's an art form. I mean, that's what kind of makes, like, you know, the people who make films a passionate lot, you know, they... They have mentors and people know their yeah. mentors and and you can see the influence as well. Yeah, it's definitely like you learn from someone who people know and trust, and then you move from you know them. Yeah, and again, talking back to that practical effect, it's like it's how the camera moves mm-hmm. to it, like how the camera picks it up. It, f- it like the actual movement of it feels genuine because it's there. Yeah, you know, and I think CGI sometimes can be clumsy. Yeah, so I don't know. I would always pick practical over. Yeah. Uh, Dick Smith, so it's Dick Smith. <laughs> uh, Dick Smith. Dick Smith. <laughs> Dick Miller's an actor, I think. Uh, anyway, so it's just that's what's the beauty of it. But then John Carpenter's amazing at setting up these widescreen shots as well. It's like everything's like an art form to him. It's this he paints a painting, and I think there's very few directors that do that that use that widescreen to its full advantage. Uh, and I can always think that John Carpenter, for me in the eighties, kind of defined what widescreen was. Uh, he uses the full frame to its yeah, its kind of perfection. And again, in the eighties as well, you never saw widescreen versions of movies, yeah. and they were always in video, panned and scanned and cropped. Uh, so it's just that way that when you do eventually get to see them over the years, and especially the thing that's now what it's now got the next release of it is a four K restoration, and I've seen a four K restoration in the cinema of the thing, and it's just perfect. It's so clean looking, and it's that way that it's it's brand it looks brand new, which is what's great about it. But here's the thing. Uh, Doing 4K restorations of stuff and uh, recuts and stuff uh, of these old movies, don't you feel like they maybe lose their kind of rough edge and they don't feel the same? I can, it depends on the film. Uh, my mum used to describe them as Rin Tin Tinny. That's how you describe <laughs> it as a certain film from like the video shop. Is it a bit Rin Tin Tinny? Uh, it would be a kind of a like a cheap kind of thing. And I must admit, I mean. I think a lot of, like, if I go and watch a lot of, like, slasher films and stuff like that, and there's, like, these crazy slasher films that, like, were so obscure and they didn't deserve to see anything beyond VHS that are now getting, like, 4K restorations, and it's that way you're just like, yeah, it's fantastic that they look clean, but something about the tracking being shit and kind of stuff like that always made these films as well. Uh, and there's this kind of little movement that a lot of people do sometimes that they'll retrograde the film a wee bit. Uh, oh, there's right. certain films that came out over the past few years. Uh, there's a film called House of the Devil, and House of the Devil is this great kind of like satanic kind of little thriller. It's very it's set in the early eighties, uh, and it's this way that when they released it in the cinema and they released it on DVD and Blu-ray, they also released a version of it on disc that was retrograded to look like it had tracking problems and stuff like that and it looked fantastic it did change the whole experience and there's a lot of vhs festivals going on now where All people right. watch vhs films i've been to a couple of them there's one in edinburgh this uh, end of the summer uh and it's a great thing to go to they just show like kind of exploitation and trashy films from vhs and it looks great um yeah in terms of like <coughs> restoring things um yeah it's like you said i mean we were talking about it once before when you were saying that obviously halloween You've seen that restored, yeah, and you kind of prefer it. You, you see know, new things, you totally see yeah, new things to it. But you like that darker kind of, yeah. I mean, I remember. Um, I mean, it's that way. Uh, yeah, when I remember when DVDs first came out and they were the big kind of change and everything. And I had this copy of Halloween Two from the like the video shop. I actually bought it from the video shop uh, before they shut down when video shops were a thing. And I remember seeing it on DVD, and I didn't realize there was it should have been that light. Because I was like, the film was so black to me. And I was just like, because obviously it was so retrograded from the VHS. And that was the thing about VHS. It's not like a DVD or a Blu-ray. The more you play it, the more retrograde it gets. So every person after you get doesn't get almost gets a different experience yeah. uh, of the film. So yeah, I remember, this is a very random story. When How, uh, Re- House on Haunted Hill came out in VHS, that I... My friends had saw it in VHS, but obviously waited ages to see it, and then saw a copy in VHS, and then said it was only until like 30 minutes into the film, he realised that Tay Diggs was in it, because <laughs> the film was so dark looking, you couldn't see <laughs> Tay Diggs, and I was just like, oh my god, how bad a copy was that that you saw? Uh, and he was like, literally, if it wasn't for the point that he smiled, he would never have noticed <laughs> at the beginning of the film, because the film's so dark. 
And I was like, because there's not a lot of lighting in the film as well. And I was like, oh my god, that must have been a really, really retrograded VHS. So anyway, yeah, that's the story about retrograded VHS. <laughs> that was not a racist comment. I really feel like, please don't take that as a racist comment. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, you better hope nobody takes it like that. No, it's not getting cut out like that. Uh, so yeah, and that's the kind of the great thing. But the thing is, I mean, come on, it looks good. That's not even a 4K restoration. That's that looks amazing though. Um, so I think it's one of these films that will always benefit from that. Uh, and it, what's great about the thing is, it's hitting generation after generation after generation. Now it's one of these films that everyone seems to love. Yeah, it is really uh, something that you could show to any generation and be a hit. Like, look at the the generation uh, movie gores right now. They absolutely adore Kurt Russell. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, like, I know he's... Oh, hold on. He's, he's late 50s, 70s? So, Kurt Russell's well... Is maybe he, pushing what, 70? No, he's pushing Whoa, 70, what? I'll say. Uh, I'll be this one, but uh, he's definitely... Uh, He's m- late sixties. Kurt Russell was a Disney actor oh. uh, back in his day uh, when he was like younger. So uh, he's been around for a long time. It wasn't until the late seventies and the eighties that he kind of hit his, his recognition. Yeah, he got his proper peak. Um, but he is a he's a he is a fantastic actor, and I've oh, always yeah. loved Kurt Russell. But he is a fantastic actor. He is sixty six. Sixty six, nice. Yeah. Like, um, like look at him right now in. Everybody loves him. Yeah. I, I don't think there's many actors that way that fans will, like, go in droves to see. I don't know if it's... But there's so many films as well that you kind of don't the, maybe realise he's been in and stuff as well. But then you'll kind of, for, wh- for every, like, you'll talk about The Thing and then you'll talk about, like, his iconic films where it's just like The Thing or Escape from New York or Big Trouble in Little China, which obviously the John Carpenter films were the ones that made him really iconic. And then he is fantastic in Overboard, uh, amazing 80s comedy with Goldie Hawn. He's fantastic in Tango and Cash as well. He's a great action kind of star. He's in this amazing film called Soldier as well. That is really good. But then you'll watch something, I don't know if you've ever seen it, Sky High, the Disney mm-hmm. film about the superheroes, yeah. which came out maybe about 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And it's like a superhero. I think it was longer than that. Yeah, a wee bit. It's a superhero family. And it's he's amazing in it, and it's just that's it's that's fantastic film. I think Kurt Russell is just genuinely a gifted actor, and I think like I think the thing that's benefited him the most is that he's never just nailed himself down to like one role. Yeah, you know he's done all these different roles, yeah. and he's always desirable because he's always good. I mean, I like to think Kurt Russell is a bit of a for a family of film lovers is a bit of a household name. You know, like if you've not seen the thing, you may have seen the Escape films. You've not seen the escape yeah. films. You've seen more modern stuff with him in it. He's hit every. I mean, every what decade he's hit. He's but he's been successful in. Uh, but I think he's one of these f- stars as well that's been. He came from the old studio system just as it was dying out. This kind of contractual kind of studio system that always kind of you know once you had a contract with them you had to make certain amount of films with them and do all that no matter what the film was. And I think he's gone through all these kind of studio systems and then now he's kind of seen that so he brings all that with them as well. And he's again amazing and hatefully as well. He's just there's so many things that he's amazing in, uh, and I think he got obviously his kind of. I mean, obviously again, I think he's got a lot to thank for Quentin Tarantino kind of gave him a career resurgence with uh, like Death Proof, and then he kind of came back a bit. And it's just that way because I mean, who doesn't love Big Trouble in Little China? I mean, it's just that way that he is, and he now, he gets it. I think he gets the cult that is behind him a wee bit, that how people are obsessed with like these movies and again big trouble little china is one of these movies that generationally everyone seems to like it i know people who are like you know your age who love it and stuff like that uh, but uh, i remember uh, when it came out and i was that way it's like so people again big trouble little china was a huge failure and it's that way that john carpenter films tend to be failures apart from halloween halloween's i think his only film that's ever been a big success and then all the other films afterwards were failures but are deemed now as classics which is kind of an th- amazing th- talent, I suppose. I think it is just a sign. Of, I think it is genuinely just a sign of the times. You know, people nowadays like to watch back, like and watch old films, and maybe in the time. I mean, at the time, I mean, films like this were probably slightly more taboo than they are now, to some yeah, degree. Yeah, it was kind of notorious for being like a kind of gory film and stuff. Yeah, like, but nowadays people do watch back like they watch things yeah. and they find their niches that they like and they backtrack and see what's been out and yeah. stuff like that so i mean 
I mean, it, it's well deserved. John, oh, yeah, John, John Carpenter, Carpenter is peak as well. This is like peak John Carpenter. I mean, John Carpenter kind of hits to about 1989, 1990, and then it's kind of from there. Uh, yeah. But he had a great kind of he had a great run as well, and I think yeah, it's that way that John Carpenter, I think he as well resists for his own kind of cult status and now in his kind of later life he kind of is appreciating it I mean I would never have thought I could have told you that if there's any point in my life I would have gone to a John Carpenter gig like that and then seeing that last year was one of the best things ever because it's that way you would never ever expect that you would ever see John Carpenter play the music from his films in a concert and it's that way that he gets it he gets what he's become I think and who he is I, I mean he's certified as one of the Masters of horror, aren't they? And yeah. I like the thing. See the thing with this film, the thing, it's. I don't see it as too much of a horror. I think it's more intense thriller. I think most John Carpenter films are deemed as horror films and they're not actually horror films. Uh, I think this I mean, is. Apart from Halloween. Halloween's probably. I mean, The Fog isn't a horror film, really. It's a ghost story and it's that way that Christine as well. People always forget he did Christine and Christine is an amazing film. He directs it really, really well and it's that way that. He just stayed, he got kind of boxed into a genre, but he kept trying to push out. And then things like this is sci-fi. They live as sci-fi. And then he can go, he's proper, balls out, does comedy as well. And it's the when he does, it's really good. He's a good, like, he does it, like, he's a good comedic director as well, I think. Yeah, uh, I would definitely, I know you just said it's not a horror. I would say this is horror. Like, I don't know, it's... you you could maybe put it down to your three act system. First one, I don't know what you would really class it as, but second act, suspense, thriller, then the third act, kind of horror. I genuinely, honestly look at this film, and I always have done, as a western. I really do. It's got this, but then see when you watch something like The Hateful Eight, which I'm assuming you maybe both guys have no, seen. No, I've not maybe seen not. it yet. The Hateful Eight is the thing but without the thing. It's, it is exactly that. It's set in one set, and it's who do you trust. It's, it's not even just that. It's like these characters come in, and they all have this intent, and you have, you, you're, you're backing somebody if you're watching it. Yeah. You're either backing somebody or you're not backing anyone. And that's the point. It's a matter of, like, who's really bad here? Yeah, like and who they're holding the fort down as well. This is the whole thing. They're kind of holding the fort down from something. They're they're barricading themselves against something. Uh, they've got their one con- common enemy, but they don't know who they can trust. Uh, the kind of thing. I and would I, I would find this more of a horror if you seen the thing. Yeah. The fact that you don't see it. Th- I mean, you know, you've got that subliminal thing that like man's greatest enemy is man itself. Do you know what I mean? It's the thing becomes. It's not murder for self defense. I do love a good tagline. Sorry, you hit with too many taglines. <laughs> in general, uh, like, but it is. It's. Did you just what's hit, it? Did you just what was it? I'm trying to think what the tagline from this. It's it's not about warm. Man is the warmest place to hide. That's a good tagline. Mm. Uh, but my favorite tagline of all time in the world, and I love to quote it all the time, is from the classic Jennifer Lopez movie. Enough. It's not murder if it's self defense. It's not murder if it's self defense. Just so you know, you can always quote that any time of the day when you're thinking about murdering someone. <laughs> Uh, but it's what I think it's but that's the beauty of the thing I think everyone takes something very different from it as well uh, it's for people who don't like horror they like it people who don't like sci-fi movies would like it and it's that way that I think it's got something for everyone uh, and that's what's great about it and that's what has made it endure uh, over the years as well and seems to be having a bigger cult than it ever has at the moment yeah definitely I've been to more thing things than Ever then, like obviously, I went to the screening of it this year when they did it in the sub zero temperature, and the fact that I paid like a hundred and something pounds for one of the vinyl this year, and it's that way that it's it's yeah, and there's a board game coming out as well. Oh, nice! Mm-hmm. Mondo releasing a big board game of it this year. The same people who did the vinyl, and uh, it's like a proper role playing game. It looks amazing, but again, we that might need to invest. In yeah, this. the website will crash a bit because people get so excited about it uh, because. It's fucking Kurt Russell. I mean, I'm sorry, that's what I'm going to say every time. That's my defence. It's just fucking Kurt Russell. And McCready is. McCready's one oh, of these kind of amazing can, How characters. can you not root for him? Yeah, he's... Like, he, he's, he's got an a long, badass hair, beard. Yeah. And he is... I, w- I would like to see... 
he's a hundred and fifty percent done with being there. Yeah. Like he's just like he's just a pilot. Fuck, he doesn't fuck care. This. Yeah. Fuck this. He's what, only there what's for happened? a job. Fucking burn it. I don't give a fuck. Yeah. He's the kind of man that we all aspire to be. Yes. I think, I think we all aspire to be. The man we all aspire to be and the man we all aspire to want. Uh, we're <laughs> coming up to one of my, f- well, definitely my favourite scene in the movie, with the uh, almost interrogation, intestine. Oh, so good. Uh, how, how can that scene just work so well? Do you know this, this was the, f- the scene that they pitched the film with uh, to get the money from Universal? Really? That they actually pitched that scene. That was, I think they may have filmed a bit of it and did that scene uh, to show them that how this would create tension and do that. And that was the film that they got their funding with. Uh, just wow. that, that scene because it was so intense. Um, so they obviously had to keep it in uh, because of that reason. Uh, oh, how how could you not keep that then? Yeah, that that just like fuels the the tension and the paranoia between everyone. Where it's yeah. a case of like right. We've seen it with, uh, I'm trying to think, the movie The Faculty, where oh, yeah. where they, they do the snort little... the drug. Yes, yeah, snort yeah. the drug, and they, like, oh, one the of them... The Faculty was such a big thing. It was... I, I as well. really yeah. I love The Faculty as well. Uh, but yeah, were her nostril shots. Yeah. Yeah, she uh, snips the bottom yeah. of the thing, yep. With her, f- with her finger that yeah. nobody knows. I know. <laughs> like oh, oh, hold on. It morphed. morphed. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's that scene is great. Uh, but then what did you th- uh, in the prequel when they redo it I actually thought it was good I, I kind of like the prequel uh, the prequel's fucking amazing Mary Elizabeth okay. Winstead uh, is yeah smoking and I loved it and I thought it genuinely it's seamless at points uh, when you watch the two of them together but it's that way that I loved that they knew they kind of had to do that scene almost again but the idea of changing it about the whole metal thing I think it was really clever uh, especially when it was going to lead to the big reveal at the end. Um, but I, yeah, again, I think it was good that they could have. It was, m- I would say, more of a homage to this yeah, than, I mean, there was than this oh, we're, we're redoing the movie. Yeah, they had the reboot thing going on. It's like, it's a reboot. It's not a remake. Reboot, reboot. Uh, but it's that way that it was. It was like, it was, yeah, they did it really well. I think they could have just copied it. They didn't. They kind of created a new idea into it. And it was that way that you're like, actually, that makes sense. Because how could it replicate metal? Uh, so the idea of talking about the felons and the teeth was quite clever, I think. Maybe that was something just done, uh, maybe thought out over the years. Like I think maybe it was. I think that it was a whole. This is an error. A fan like theory, yeah. like oh, this is how you can tell so and so is not how, the alien. One of them's got an earring. How can he be the yes. alien? So then yes. they just go and rectify it, and then think, no, we'll just change it then. Yeah. Uh, so it is. It's kind of good that they kind of obviously paid attention. But I think the I remember when I was reading about them writing, they wrote the the prequel um they literally went through it scene by scene and by scene of the thing and they knew that uh like especially the bit where they go to the norwegian base that they had to a replicate that base they had to give explanation of why there was holes in certain places in the walls and they would have to do everything and i think they did it really well it's that way that everything got an explanation even like throwaway things got an explanation which was kind of cool uh so yeah it's just is it I don't know. Is it? Would just uh, is it John Carpenter's best film? I think it's the one that he'll be remembered for the most. Uh, having said before, with Halloween not being my greatest horror movie, I would. Can you actually uh, hear me roll my eyes from here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure that came yeah. up on the soundtrack. Of the <laughs> That's why it's just going there. Uh, Dog. I would I would say this is my favorite John Carpenter movie. I, 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 I it's a close. It's maybe just edged out above bug, uh, Big Trouble. Oh, John Carpenter films are like pizza for me. There's no such thing as a bad John Carpenter film. Yeah, uh, and flavor of the month. Yeah, it depends on what mood I'm in. Uh, I can go from loving this. I can go from loving Halloween, and I can go from Big Trouble. Yeah, uh, and it's not just. You know, my, but then Escape from New York, and then you go, oh, Escape from okay. York. and then oh, and then I go, oh, Christine, and I forget about Christine, <laughs> and then I go, oh, like that, and then it all kind of comes, and then it does, you get to that point where it hits, oh, Prince of Darkness, and you think, oh, Prince of Darkness, and this was the first of his Apocalypse trilogy, yes, because he did the Apocalypse trilogy, and this was the first part of it. So the thing was the first part, They Live was the second part, and Prince of Darkness was the final part of it. Uh, about films kind of have an apocalyptic feel. I mean, in terms of like <coughs> favorite John Carpenter, John Carpenter films, 
Um, but if you I say mean, Ghost of Mars, I will stab you. No, no, my top, my top, <laughs> my top three are Big Trouble, The Thing, and The Escape. Yeah. New York. I love The Escape films. The first one. Do you mean The Escape film? <laughs> are you pretending that the second one doesn't? What film are you talking about? There's Escape from New York. There's Escape from LA. No, there's not. <laughs> I just escaped from New York. Just escaped from New York. No, there right. never was escape from LA. That was just a dream. <laughs> a lucid dream. That was a very a drug lucid dream. A lot of people <laughs> participated in it, but it wasn't real. Okay, escape from New York. That is the predominant favourite. Thank you for it's the favourite. <laughs> it's the the favourite. <laughs> it's the only film. Yeah, it's the only film. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love the thing, and I love. Too late, you love the thing. Sorry, I, that was too easy. <laughs> I had too easy to get that joke in there. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting for you to say it like for <laughs> about <laughs> twenty minutes. How can I get him to say that I love the thing? Well, we know you love the thing. Yes, I'll say it again. I love the thing, <laughs> <laughs> and I love Big Trouble, and I love, I love the thing, Big Trouble. Oh, this says a lot more about your love life. She's so you love escaping with the thing and having some big trouble. Oh, and someone else's little chain. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, we do all know that uh, James does love Big Enders. Oh, oh Big Enders. Oh, this is going to cause controversy. I know, but, it's uh, not Big Enders. Going on to Big Enders. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, or, or, it's, no, get, get fucked, James. <laughs> all right, Chris. You were successful last time, you son of a bitch. This time, you will not be so lucky. I've got it. From two sources, Ooh. that the production budget is ten million and fifteen million, so we'll go between ten and fifteen million. Okay. Okay. Don't don't you fucking help him, James? No, no, no. Oh, oh no, we we are we are against him. Oh, He's gosh. the enemy. See, I got it. I got it as close as I could have got it. Like last time, and he did not let me have it. I was like a thousand pound off or something, and he didn't let me have it. It was a couple thousand, hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah, it was a couple. It wasn't a hundred thousand. It was like a ballpark thousand. Um, in, in fact, you were two million out. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So we're talking yes. about its initial... Uh, domestic. Domestic. Yes. In 1982. 1982. Oh, fuck. That was four years before I was born. Fuck off. Uh, <laughs> I was five, so it's fine. I'm still young. Uh, still a young pup. Let me think. See, I know it didn't make. It's, and we're just talking about domestic gross. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say you have to get it exact because it's a pretty specific number. Mario's asking for. Yeah, th- yeah, like close. We're not like going give us the actual figure, you dick. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this. I can only find the domestic take, which is US, so yeah. I would hazard a guess that it's probably like double, but yeah, I but we'll go with domestic. Well, okay, I, I I know it definitely didn't make its budget back, so it was apparently it came in like as a it is deemed as a failure, so that means it technically didn't make its budget back. So maybe I would say about eight million. <laughs> Try again. Do they convert it with like? Nope. Inflation. Domestic total gross. So that's America. Merca. <laughs> James, watch the phone. You're going to give him the spoilers. What? <laughs> this might shock you. So you've got two more chances. Okay, I'll probably then say... Wait, we'll, we'll give you a higher or lower system. We're, 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 we're nice people here. Mario's being progressive because okay. I need to fill it with him. So it was higher than eight. Okay, twenty-seven. Lower. Oh. Sixteen. Uh, Nineteen point six. Okay. So. Aye. So I thought it didn't make its budget back. Well, it must have, but. It, it I mean, I think they were expecting know, more from that as they well. They were obviously expecting um, more from it. Okay, that's, well, that's not bad, but it's probably made a lot more. Mo- and then in inflation terms, it's made quite a bit of money. Yeah, and plus all the re-releases, yeah. uh, which is special I, think why uni- I also think is why Universal stuff. keep relaunching it and relaunching it, and relaunching it. I think it's one of those films that they could know they can make a lot of money off of as well. 
it's just one of those films. I mean, I literally I might have it in about 19,000 formats. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not kidding when I say that. I think I've got an original VHS of it. And oh, got, please. And on the wall, an actual, not a laser disc, an original video disc that came out. What? It should be on the wall in the hall. Um, that came uh, out of it. You're getting robbed, mate, all right? I've also got a fog one as well. That's a video disc. They weren't laser discs at the time. Laser discs hadn't been invented yet as a brand. They came out as video discs. Nice. Um but yeah, so um, that's the thing. So, what would you rate it? You can't rate the thing. I don't think you can. I think anyone who tried to rate the thing is just, who are you? Look at your life choices. Why are you rating the thing? You should just accept it. Accept that it's a, the best film ever. It was <laughs> one of those films that it was just, and it's always, in, it should be in everyone's top 10. Who are you? Why are you listening to this? You know, you should know about the thing already. You've watched it. <laughs> If you don't like the thing, Chris yeah. will know. Just, Chris will I know. know. I will know. I will come and find you. Just forfeit life, yeah. if that's the case. Just stop. I should have actually started this. We should have started that, this actual podcast going, have you seen the thing? If not, then stop. Like that. Stop everything. Listen to the thing. Watch the thing. Come well, back. Mario, what would you rate the thing? Uh, well, I've already gave away that I can't find any fault with it. It's definitely my favourite John Carpenter movie. And... It is one of my top ten movies. It's al- it's always like in and around the kind of bottom five of it. You know, it, I always thought you were a top, never a bottom. Yeah, I like to spice it up, mate. <laughs> like to keep it versatile. A L- little bit of change goes a far uh, goes a long way. Changes you know? goes a rest. Uh, and as I said previously, with our predator one, I'm neglecting that coming. Uh, it's got to be a 10. If, if if it's in my top 10 movies all the time, how can I not give it a 10? The, like, I'd find no fault with it. It's what I love. Sci- sci-fi, horror, suspense, all in one. It's it's almost like a... Uh, how can I put it? A coked-up alien? Yeah. Because it's got that m- like bit more as action into it. slow as alien. See, I think... I think in your head you're thinking there's more action in it, but I think everyone does. I I, I feel it does, but it doesn't. Like, but I, I to know, be fair, I what? No, well, well, there's, <laughs> the there's more. What there's have more you seen that's been going on that's quite. You would deem as the, action apart from maybe a couple of little slaps and a punch. Uh, it's, burning. Yeah, but burnings. Those moments uh, are very few and far in between. I I would say it's definitely more than Alien. Mm, I think it's a very alien. similar uh, pace and it's really slow. I think it's one of these films. It's like. Like Halloween, in the sense that you think there's more violence in Halloween than there actually is. I think it's very much well implied that these things are there, but they're not. It's so good that you see something else in it that it's not. And I think Alien is like that as well. You think a lot happens in Alien, especially in that first maybe hour to forty, like forty-five minutes, and it doesn't. It's quite slow. Like you said, there, yeah, oh, one yeah, of my yeah. favorite scenes is coming up. That was like twenty minutes ago, and it's still not come up in your head. You think you're further in the movie than you are, yeah. but then I always think that is the thing with the thing. You always watch it thinking, "Oh, I know the structure of this film," and then deep down, every time I watch it, I'm always like, "Oh yeah, I forgot about that bit happens there." Yeah, but the, if I compare this to Alien. There is a lot more action in it. Like it, it's very short bits, yeah. whereas uh, it's like maybe the dog scene or them chasing someone and then burning them. And I think when and it's, it has its moments, they're it, big. They're yeah, big yeah. moments. But then I think there's a lot more. It's that similar p- pace. I think it's very slow paced and it's very. Yeah, it does its kind of you know, it does its job. Yeah, if a movie was made, if this was made now, you can guarantee that it would probably just be non-stop action. Yeah, they would shave a good half hour off of it as well if it was running time, just because it would be too much talk. Too much talking. People don't like to see talking. Yeah, but the thing about this is it's just, it goes on as long as it needs to. Yeah. Because it's telling a story. That's the sole purpose of the film, to tell a story. I think. How ambiguous is that ending for you? Because uh, I can always say what John Carpenter says... And the way he thinks how it ended, but I don't know. I always kind of see it. How is I it? I think I've got I've got a theory how it ends. How, how, right, so how is it? He uh, interprets John Carpenter always says it's clearly in um, Childs, and it's that way that McCready is the survivor, and it's always that way. I think I've always thought, and I don't know if it was just me, but the way it's acted, especially when 
McCready gives Child the drink and starts laughing when he takes it. I always got the vibe that he passed it to him because it's that way. It's almost like McCready was taken over at the end and he passed it on to Childs because it just seems to be it's, it seems to be acted that way for me. I, I kind of take it as Childs is the thing and there, there is that uh, kind of fan theory of uh, he's gave him uh, gasoline yeah. to drink and as soon as he's drinking it he's just like oh fuck not this you you, you fucking survived yeah like he's kind of like past a point of no return almost uh the shining style just like that yeah. that's broken that is like done him he's like fuck everybody's been taken now and he knows that he knows but he's ha- he's not ready to kind of end it just yeah. yet almost uh i don't know if you ever i think you can see it on youtube the tv version of the thing there's bits uh basically i think we talked about this as well when we talked about halloween it's that way that when they sold the rights to televisions uh because obviously they knew they would have to cut some of the violence out so they would have to bulk up some scenes uh there's a television version of the thing uh which gives a character introduction to each of the characters uh, at the beginning of it. So basically when you see someone going on, there's some extra kind of scenes that aren't in it uh, in the normal cut, but then there'll be bits where you'll see like the characters on their own and they won't really be doing anything. And then a voiceover comes over and describes who the people are and what they do. And it's actually really strange to see. I think you can watch it on YouTube, like see the introductions, but it's kind of cool. And it's this kind of mythical kind of TV version that somebody might release because it does actually explain a lot about their pasts of the characters and why they're there uh which is kind of cool so that was a random tangent because i knew i wanted to talk about that at some point but uh it does give a lot more to mccready and who he is as a person blah 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 youtube it um i think i would rate uh, i'm kind of with chris on this why would you rate it it's it's good we know it's good there's no point in putting a number to it to be honest it's it's just good it's a great film didn't hate it's it's remake either also mm. prequel but, but but we need but we need to rate things right okay 10 10 10s across the board 10 for the gaze you know 10 and 10 for the straight the straight like the only one like ever the only one in the world ever uh we match straight <laughs> <laughs> so he says so it's spaghetti until you heat it up <laughs> <laughs> I know. I've never met Matt. I'm sure he's very heterosexual. <laughs> he is very <laughs> heterosexual. <laughs> and James has Unless tried. Unless he's not a rhymes. <laughs> but yeah, the thing is great. If you've not seen it... <laughs> Who are you? What you choices have you made with your life that's led to you <laughs> never, <laughs> ever <laughs> seeing the thing? And if you've never heard of the thing, then that's even worse. Well, it'd be really worse if you're like listen, about an hour and a half into listening to us talking about something <laughs> and you're like, what the fuck are they talking about? <laughs> Uh, what is the thing? Well, you keep referring to this thing. What thing are you referring to? Is that a big thing? Is, <laughs> is it a it small a thing? thing? Is it? Is, is it a popular thing? Something about um, the thing and how it's thing? in people. Like. The thing thing? Dr. Zeus thing one, thing two, thing yeah, three, thing four. Yeah, that. Or we've also got lisps and we're saying... Chang? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I think that's the end of the show. Thing? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, if you like this and our other stuff, then you'll know where to find us. If not, then you can head over to SoundCloud at Glaswegian Geeks. We're on iTunes as well with at Glaswegian Geeks. We've got a little YouTube channel. We'll be sticking some content up there very, very shortly. Uh, just have a little search for Glaswegian Geeks on there and you will find us. And also, please... Stay up to date, like our Facebook page and Twitter, both at Glaswegian Geeks. Just have a little search and you will find it. You will also find at the top of both of those pages our little uh, code and link for Ripped Apparel, where you can get a whole 10% off your total bud. No, total. I was going to say total budget, but yeah, don't have a budget. Go and spend like 50 quid. Get five dollars off you know why why the fuck not why have you got to be american because that because it ripped a barrel deals with dollars oh, okay. it's a 
I think with shipping to the UK, it works out to be like 12 quid. So, so to get your own merchandise, we have to get it from the UK. Uh, the US to bring to the UK. Yeah. But it's actually pretty quick for ripped. <laughs> I will say that. And that's not me just uh, stroking. There's no jobs in this country. <laughs> I know. Damn, Americans are taking it. <laughs> taking, over our jo- taking, over, taking over Antarctica. Taking over people. They're the real thing. Uh, Chris, can you mind our sign-off for horror ones? No. Screw sleep, was it not? Oh, it was, but wasn't it? Wasn't that just yeah, pertained to that film? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, sign off for this. Are, are we at war with Norway? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's the first quote from the film that came into my head. There. <laughs> Geek out. <laughs> Don't stop there. Are we at war with Norway? That we, is, someone leave, says that in the film. I know, but maybe let, we're at war with Norway. Yeah, but let's just leave it. Let's just leave it on that. Let people think. Are we at war with Norway though? Who knows? <laughs> maybe. My way or the Norway. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off. We're fucking done. <laughs> <laughs>